curious. I am curious. Curious by nature. Researchers who study Alzheimer's are looking at the way the disease changes the brain from every possible angle. You've probably heard about amyloid plaques and neural tangles, but there is another field of study that looks closely at the way brain cells metabolize small molecules such as lipids and amino acids. This study of metabolomics reveals that patients with Alzheimer's disease often exhibit dysfunction of these processes in the brain. Our guest today is working to narrow down what this might mean and how it might help to better diagnose, predict, and prevent the progression of Alzheimer's. Dr. Graham, welcome. Please introduce yourself. My name is uh, Stuart Graham. I'm the John and Marilyn Bishop uh, Endowed Chair for Alzheimer's Disease Research uh, across Corwell Health. Um, I've been here now approximately 11 years, uh, and I've, I use predominantly um, a platform called Metabolomics for the study um, of Alzheimer's disease, uh, and also identifying those individuals at greatest risk of developing the disease years before clinical symptoms become apparent. So tell me more about metabolomics. What does that mean? So the easiest way to describe it is that it is the downstream cascade of everything in terms of metabolically, uh, which happens in your body. So we have our genetics, which is at the top of the ladder. Then we have what's called our transcriptomics or proteomics, uh, and then we have our metabolomics. So basically, we're looking at all the small molecules. So things that people will understand are uh, we're looking at amino acids, uh, we're looking at nutrients, we're looking at vitamins, um, all the small molecules within the body, uh, and they are all a result of all the reactions which happened previously. So for me as a metabolomicist, um, they are something which gives the greatest um, link to any given disease. Because if we see perturbations in those, um, we can directly relate those to what's happened previously in the cascade. So I assume because you're also studying Alzheimer's that they are also in the brain. Yes. Yeah, that, that's what you're studying and looking at some of those of how they relate to Alzheimer's disease. But tell me more about that. Uh, we look at everything. We look at peripheral tissues. When I say peripheral tissues, we look at uh, blood serum, blood plasma. Uh, we look at cerebral final, spinal fluid, which is that fluid which surrounds the brain and it is in direct contact with the brain. We also look at brain using different modalities. But generally, the only way to really study the brain is using post-mortem human brain. It's considered the gold standard, and it's something that we've been working with the NIH. We've been working with collaborators across the pond uh, in getting access to. And is that very difficult to be able to access? Yeah, it is in some ways, because if you can imagine, um, these individuals, before they die, they donate their brain, um, or they, they propose to donate their brain. So the people who who store these, who house these, who, who characterize these samples, uh, steward them very, very closely. So your justification in getting access to these samples has to be solid. It has to be bulletproof um, because not everyone, while everyone would like uh, to get access to these samples from people in or or, or uh, field of research, it's not always possible. Um, and again, that's something that, that, that I'm an advocate for because these, these samples should be stewarded in the way that they are. So tell me about your current research. Um, in terms of Alzheimer's disease, because we do a lot in the realm of Parkinson's disease as well. And that's going to become very, very apparent in the near future because some of the findings that we've come up with very, very recently. Uh, but in Alzheimer's disease, we've been developing tests uh, to identify those individuals uh, who are at greatest risk of developing the disease years before they become apparent. So we've been funded by the Alzheimer's Association and different foundations across the country to develop non-invasive tests. Um, when I say non-invasive, uh, we are very interested in using serum. We're interested in using urine. Or, and the one that we're really interested in developing is saliva. So we have someone spit in a tube. Uh, we can analyze that and give the doctor um, a percentage likelihood that that person is going to develop dementia through Alzheimer's disease. Um, now, why is this important? People say to us, well, okay, um, you, you can tell the soul is going to develop dementia. Well, if you look at the new drugs which are coming on the market at the moment, you're only going to be prescribed those drugs um, if you've got what's called MCI or mild cognitive impairment leading to dementia or mild cognitive impairment with dementia. And the reason for that is, is that these drugs aren't going to work if you've already got Alzheimer's disease. 
So if you've already got Alzheimer's disease, it's called a neurodegenerative disease. The degeneration has already happened within your brain. We can't grow those neurons back. So the idea is that if we get the individual earlier in the biological cascade uh, or the pathogenesis of the disease, we can slow or stop that progression. Now, what does that mean in terms uh, of a person's outlook? Maybe you can give that individual five more years of being cognitively healthy, of being able to maintain active daily living activities. What does that mean? That means um, dressing themselves, going to the store, doing the gardening, interacting with their grandkids. And five years for someone whose family has been directly, um, I'm going to say the word, traumatized by Alzheimer's disease, uh, five years is a lot. And th that even might be an underestimation. The other interesting thing is that stratification of patients. And what does that mean? Stratification of patients is identifying those individuals with a specific disease. So Alzheimer's disease leading up to dementia. Alzheimer's is the leading cause um, of disease which leads to dementia, but there are other types of causes as well. We've got vascular cognitive impairment and dementia. Uh, we have um, dementia with Lewy bodies. It's, it's similar in a way, uh, but it's got different proteins which fold in the brain. Um, but it's very, very difficult to get a clean catch. Sometimes the doctors don't know. So if we were able to accurately identify and put these individuals into their respective groups, once these go to clinical trial, um, we believe, everyone believes actually, is that these clinical trials would be a lot more effective. So billions and billions of dollars have been thrown at this. Uh, and one of the main reasons why a lot of these trials failed is that they've got the wrong patients in the right trials. Uh -huh. so we were able to identify those patients and get them into the correct trials then maybe those drugs would be a lot more useful. And so right now, initially, it's for getting people into the trials, and then it could also be based on whether these medications will help them or not, even later after. Correct. If we, if we can stratify them in terms of personalized medicine approach as well, um, and prognosis based on the different drugs that are available, that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. the, um, the, the other interesting facet of this as well, of course, is that uh, we would like to bring in other types of diseases and then say, well, okay, to the treating clinician, which doesn't have to be a specialist in this instance, doesn't have to be a geriatrician, a neurologist, um, a neuropsychologist. This could be their primary care provider. We can say to them, well, okay, based on your diagnosis, we think that this person has got a percentage likelihood of developing dementia through this route. Maybe that's Alzheimer's, vascular cognitive impairment, hippocampal sclerosis, you name it. Um, but the aim here is always never to never to replace the treating physician's uh, diagnosis. Um, it's only to give them a backup uh, to say, okay, you're right in terms of what you're doing. Because at the minute, they've got imaging. They're going to do MRI. They're going to do expensive imaging uh, called PET, where they can look at specific proteins within the brain uh, and do some modeling based on that to give them additional information. But again, Alzheimer's disease diagnosis, and it doesn't matter what clinician you talk to, specialist or non-specialist, they're going to tell you that it's very, very subjective. So if I was personally, and I was having problems cognitively, um, I would probably go to the more aged doctor in the room who's got a lot more experience in diagnosing the disease, just simply because of the subject and the subital. Tell me a little bit about what is the most fascinating part of your, your work, what you find most interesting. So one of the one of the big projects we're doing now, which is a nationally based project, is called BAU Map. So it's called the Black American United Memory Aging Project. We're working with folks at Clemson. We're working with folks at Johns Hopkins. We're working with um, collaborators of mine at North Carolina A and T. Uh, we're basically we are longitudinally following uh, those Black Americans over the age of fifty five. Um, to determine why black individuals are two to three times more at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease uh, than their Caucasian counterparts. Now, when you put that into perspective, uh, and I always steal this quote from my boss who says, Alzheimer's disease is a lady's disease that men get. So ladies are two to three times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than men. And then if you go to the black population, they are two to three times more likely to develop Alzheimer's than Caucasians so black ladies are four to six times more likely to develop the disease than uh, a Caucasian male. So, Do you know why that is? 
So this is why we're trying to get to the bottom of it. So we're doing um, a few different things. Um, so we are essentially sending out, we've developed these cognitive tests, which we've embedded in phones, and we're going to send that information, or we're going to send those. We don't call them tests to our, our, our um, participants. We call them games. They are games. They're cognitive learning games. Um, I've done them. They're not easy. Uh, <laughs> so we're sending those out. Uh, these individuals will, will follow these throughout a week. Um, what we're also doing there from the Corewell side of things is that we are sending out uh, genetic testing kits. We're also sending out kits whereby we can collect saliva and collect urine. So what we're doing with the saliva is that we're measuring telomere length. So a telomere is, um, how do I best describe this? If you, if you think about DNA and you think about your chromosomes, and there's that little X, so we've got 23 pairs of chromosomes, uh, or 46 chromosomes, uh, 23 from parent, each parent, which makes up this little X. At the top of them, they are these caps. So these caps are something that I would liken to uh, the tops of a shoelace, the plastic, the protective ends uh, of each one of these, uh, of these tops. And what happens with age is that these shorten. But what happens with um, increased biostressors, so we're interested in geographical location, we're interested in looking at um, uh, perceived racism, we're looking at perceived discrimination, perceived stress, uh, like I said, geographical location, psychological um, stressors. So we're combining all of these and then looking at telomere length as well to see how this shortens quicker uh, genetically in a black population as opposed to a white population. And we're doing this over a period of five years. We're also interested when we're collecting urine is that we're collecting what's called cytokines. So these cytokines are directly related to inflammation. Mm -hmm. Inflammation is one of the main, um, uh, one of the main associated symptoms um, with dementia um, at its onset. So again, we're linking inflammation, these inflammatory biomarkers, to all these biophysiological factors uh, and trying to determine are there lifestyle factors which we can change for these individuals to reduce their risk of developing the disease further down the line? Because we're interested in those individuals over the age of 55. The cascade of dementia doesn't start when you're in your 60s or your 70s. It starts when you're in your 40s. Is this going to help people to maybe get a bit of a sense like that if there's that mild cognitive impairment that you were talking about? Potentially. Um, Potentially. We will... Or it leads to be aware of that and to start thinking about it and maybe talking to their physician. Um, speaking to their physician earlier is probably the best piece of advice that I can give to them. If they are not feeling well, and we, we have a word for it in Ireland where I'm from, whereby they say they are doting. Uh, and that's similar to what someone with mild cognitive impairment would feel. They're like, oh, well, I forgot about this. I forgot about that. There's no heart. Go see your PCP. Uh, go talk to them, express to them your concerns, um, because there are things coming down the pipeline, and there are things which are currently available on pharmacy at different um, health institutions, which can have an impact on your trajectory. Great. And you said that it starts from 40 years old. Is that yeah, in your mid 40s? Yeah. Because if you yeah. look at the trajectory, uh, this stuff takes years. Um, if you, if, I wish I could draw the graph here. But essentially, it just comes along and it raises gradually, gradually, gradually. And these, uh, this, this graph is rising in the proteins within your brain uh, and their accumulation. And then you've got another line just above it, and it's going the same way. Uh, but that's your cognition, which is decreasing. And then when the two meet, when there's the accumulation of enough protein, your cognition has gone down. That's when clinical symptoms become apparent. That's when your degeneration is starting to take place. That's when we really need to be attacking the drug or using the drug to attack the disease, rather. Tell me more about uh, the Parkinson's data that you said. Oh, so Parkinson's. So funnily, I've been working with the Michael J. Fox Foundation now uh, for a, a few years. They are an absolute fantastic institution. who have been raising millions and millions of dollars over the years. Um, for both the treatment and identification of those individuals uh, at greatest risk of developing Parkinson's disease. So one of the things with Parkinson's disease, uh, again, it's important to identify those individuals earlier um, before the neurodegeneration sinks in. It's a little bit different than, than Alzheimer's disease in that 
there's different proteins and there's different parts of the brain which break down. Um, at the moment, there's symptomatic treatments available for it. So I contacted the Michael J. Fox Foundation. We had shown in mouse models of the disease um, that we were able to identify those individuals in the prodromal stage or the preclinical stage of the disease, which hadn't been shown previously. Um, and they were very interested in this and asked us, can you uh, recapitulate your findings in a human cohort of the disease? And I said, well, there's only one way to find out. Can you provide us with the samples or with the money to do so? And we've been hitting this with a number, I'm talking about three or four years. Like I say, we got a nugget every three or four years. We've been hitting this quite hard um, for three or four years with numerous people coming and going and working on these projects. Um, but finally, um, just as of last week, and in collaboration with colleagues of ours at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, we've been able to identify a panel of biomarkers which will enable us to identify those individuals in that prodromal phase. Mm -hmm. We are so excited about it at the moment because as you can imagine, these are elderly individuals. These are individuals who are on a lot of what we call polypharmacy as well. So we've been having to dig through all our data and remove all the polypharmacy because these are small molecules as well. We're using metabolic limits. So as of last week, uh, or sorry, the week before, uh, we got the data. Um, and what we want to do now is develop that test. So what we do is that we did a comprehensive or global scan in the first instance. Uh, and then now what we want to do is develop a test whereby we can get it from bed, bed to bed site. If we have that test, then we need to validate that. And of course, that's going back to the Michael J. Fox Foundation, asking them for additional funds, or even going to the National Institutes of Health and asking them, okay, can you help us out uh, in terms of funding so we can develop this test um, and, and have it uh, for those individuals uh, who are at risk of developing Parkinson's disease. So the other thing about it is, is that this would be a test which would be available to everybody because it's not expensive to run. Mm -hmm. The aims of what we're trying to do. We want to make it inexpensive so it's available to everybody. Wonderful. I mean, there's a lot of new, it seems like there's a lot of hopeful information both around Alzheimer's and Parkinson's that's coming out as... Yes. Two new drugs released recently, or two new <laughs> drugs went through phase two trials for Parkinson's very, very recently. One is, uh, again, like Alzheimer's disease, is a monoclonal antibody, and they look to have um, effects for uh, treating the disease and not against symptoms associated with it. Your field is very fascinating, and I wish you all of the best and that you find solutions to these problems. Me and you both. Me and you both. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll steal a uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation um, quote whereby we're here until the disease isn't. Um, and that's what our lab is trying to do as well, either be Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease. Those are the two main focus areas of myself and my faculty. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Curious by Nature is a production of Newswise. More than 7,000 journalists get the Newswise wires. Visit newswise.com and find out how to spread your news today.